Good evening and welcome to another in the series of webinars presented by the Epilepsy Foundation of Metropolitan New York in this National Epilepsy Awareness Month, November. This evening, our topic is going to be seizure clusters, unmet needs and emerging formulations. Before we start and introduce two marvelous presenters this evening, we'd like to take a moment to thank Equestive Therapeutics who graciously have decided to support and help this evening. We have with us tonight two very well-known medical authorities in the New York area who have been members of the Epilepsy Foundation of Metropolitan New York's Professional Advisory Board for years. And Dr. Stephen Wolf, Patricia McGoldrick, NP, MPA, MSN. They are at the Boston Children's Health Physicians, New York and Connecticut, the Maria Ferrari Children's Hospital, New York Medical College. We're very pleased to welcome them this evening. And we'd like to turn it over now to Stephen and to Patricia. Hey guys, thanks for coming. Patty and I really appreciate you guys spending some time with us tonight and we're excited to be here. Um, Patty and I are gonna give you a nice little presentation though it looks like who's in control i am steve oh you're so, in control so thank you all, again thank you all for being here thank you chilton for inviting us and logan for setting this up and a quest of course of course for um providing support so we're going to talk tonight about seizure clusters and unmet needs. And this program is sponsored by a non-branded unrestricted grant from Equestive Therapeutics, which is going to the Epilepsy Foundation of Metropolitan New York. And we appreciate that. So we're going to first start talking about what are seizure clusters. So an overview of seizure clusters, a definition of them, which is sort of a tall order. And then we're going to talk a little bit about factors that might increase the risk of people having seizures that occur in clusters. Then we're gonna talk about managing the seizure clusters, management of patients with seizure clusters, seizure action plans, and the review of, of the new rescue medication options, which is really very, very exciting. So seizure clusters, an estimated 30% of patients experience seizure clusters. So these are when you have not just one, but maybe you'll have two or three um, and they'll happen in a short amount of time. It could be anywhere from an hour, half an hour, a few in 24 hours. That's how we sort of look at clusters. Um, and this happens despite being on anti epileptic medication. We don't really understand why some people just have one seizure and they're done for months. And then why some children or adults will have two or three in a row. We're not really sure what, why it unleashes that way and we're trying to understand this better um but you know there's a lot of things that are involved here you know that it why the brain might not be stopping when we need it to that maybe that there's some seizure stopping mechanism that isn't really working properly or that there's some excitability in the brain that just gets totally out of control or there's some self-feeding positivity loop that just keeps going and going and going and we can't seem to break it. And I, and I think it's some combination of, of those kind of thought processes. Um, and we know that this is pretty prevalent, um, that it ranges in patients anywhere from 13 to 76%. When you see a range that large means we really actually don't know how often this happens. Um, but Patty and I know from fielding many telephone calls uh, that this does happen a lot. And this happens in the inpatient setting as well as at home. Uh, we'll get a number of calls saying, well, Johnny had two seizures in the past three hours and like going, and we know from his history, he's gonna have four more before the night's over. And I think that's sort of really an, important because we're all used to talking about status where it doesn't stop, but these could be short little ones and you have multiple ones. Go ahead, Patty. All right, so how do we define seizure clusters? So the typical definition is two or more seizures within 24 hours, or you can define it as bouts or episodes when people have increased seizure activity. So there's sort of, there's an old saying that says seizures beget seizures. And that means that if you have one seizure, you're more likely to have another one. Now, most people, and what we say to people who come in for the first time with seizures is that typically most seizures stop by themselves within three to five minutes. 
The worrisome part is when they last longer than that. And that, as Steve just said, is status or status epilepticus. But there are other people who have, they have one seizure and then you know they're going to have another one or they're going to have two or three more within that day. Parents say that to us all the time. If he has a seizure, I know it's going to be a bad day and there's going to be three or four. So we've been trying for years as a group, um, the epilepsy community has been trying for years to come up with a real name for this. Um, sometimes it's called acute repetitive seizures. Sometimes some people call them serial seizures or seizure flurries or flurries of seizures. But basically what they are are seizures that are closely grouped together and are repetitive. So they can be short, but they're an increase in the seizure activity over the baseline. So for somebody who has typically a seizure a week or a seizure once a month, there'll be these periods of time where they have a bunch of like a bunch of seizures in a short period of time. They might have a day where they have six or seven, or they might have 15 minutes where they have three. And this often results in activating the need for a rescue medicine. The problem with rescue medicines are that they're usually, the prescription is usually written to say, give this if you have a seizure for more than three minutes or more than five minutes. So people are at a loss as to what to do when they have two or three seizures in 15 minutes. And they'll call and they'll say, well, I didn't know whether to give the meds or not because you never said do it for two or three seizures. The thing is too, that these are not, it's not status because the patient returns to baseline between the seizures. So they're not consistently, constantly seizing and never coming back to themselves. They have a seizure, they're back to baseline, they have another seizure. And it can be any seizure type. It doesn't have to be a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. It could be an absence seizure, which is a staring spell. It can be a focal or localization related seizure, which affects one area of the body, depending on what area of the brain is affected. And they can be little short, quick, mild seizures, or they can range all the way up to really horrible and severe generalized tonic-clonic. We had a patient over the weekend who the mother called and he had had seven within a couple of hours. And then we gave him rescue meds and he had another seven. So she really didn't, wasn't quite sure what to do. And that's the a prime example. So having seizure clusters is a burden. And we know that this really affects the quality of life. Um, and we know that seizure severity, seizure frequency, it affects families, it creates worry, it creates loss of control. These are all factors that just affect our families. Um, we know that there is a high risk of injury more with seizure clusters than it is with status, which is interesting because you'll have a seizure, you sort of get up, you try to do something, then you'll fall and it'll happen again. Um, there's a large financial burden with seizure clusters. <clears throat> and we look at families that have this where there's reduced income potential for the patient or even the family because the stress of what's happening or how it interferes with life or ending up in the emergency room and missing work. There's an increased risk of unemployment for the patient uh, because you never know when the cluster is going to happen and how it interferes with the whole day. And of course, a higher direct and indirect cost of medical care. And looking at an interesting survey, it shows that the impact of seizure clusters was greater among patients and caregivers than clinicians. Um, and that 70% of patients with seizure clusters reported an association with negative career effects. And that most patients reported that seizure clusters led to exhaustion, stress, a sense of helplessness and fear. And so the real point of this talk is how do we put the control and help the families control these situations and not feel helpless? And that's sort of the key or overbearing key that we're trying to get across in this lecture. All right, so what, so what factors will increase the risk for seizure clusters? We have a bunch of questions coming at the end of this talk. Um, and many of them are around this topic, asking what, uh, you know, how you can reduce the risk of seizure clusters and what causes it. So people who have severe epilepsies that are also called epileptic encephalopathies. So these may be genetically mediated. They may have come from um, some abnormality within the brain. And these are people that respond poorly to medications and they have poor seizure control. So they're having frequent seizures or fairly frequent seizures at baseline. Um, and, and harder to control and maybe on a bunch of different meds, they're at increased risk for having clusters of seizures. People who've had any kind of trauma, so car accidents, um, uh, motorcycle injuries, anything where there's been a trauma to the brain can cause um, 
more risk of seizures because you're already at risk for seizures because you've had this trauma. Remote symptomatic epilepsy. So that's the same idea, um, an epilepsy that results from something in the brain, like a malformation that's been there since birth, a stroke, again, trauma. People who have, so extratemporal seizure localization. So that's an interesting um, topic. So people who have seizures, oftentimes the seizures will arise from the temporal lobe. People who have seizures that come from the temporal lobe, that's really something that can often be managed with surgery. But people who have seizures who come from areas other than the temporal lobe, so extratemporal spikes or generalized abnormalities. So a slow spike and slow wave on an EEG, this, we, this is one of the epileptic encephalopathies we're referring to Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, harder to control seizures. People who have tonic seizures, again, harder to control, more at risk for repetitive seizures or clusters. People who have a history of status epilepticus. So status epilepticus is a seizure that doesn't stop. It just keeps going and going. And the ones particularly who have convulsive status. So those are the big generalized tonic-clonic seizures. That's kind of what you think of when you think of a seizure jerking and stiffening. Um, so not absence, not prolonged absence, which is prolonged staring spells, but these nasty convulsive generalized tonic-clonic seizures that last for many, many minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. People have more frequent seizures, again, back to poor seizure control. People who have had epilepsy for a longer period of time, people who started in childhood, but the next, the next line says early age at epilepsy onset, so the earlier the epilepsy onset and the longer that you have seizures, the more difficult it is to control and by the same token, more at risk for clusters of seizures. This, this slide is a shout out to the great work done at Montefiore by Cheryl Hout. And those of you guys who see the, some of the epilepsy people up at Montefiore and to Larry Hirsch at Yale. Uh, these guys have done some amazing work over the past 20 years looking at seizure clusters and teaching us how to understand it and to treat it better. So great science done at these centers. So recognizing seizure clusters and triggers, this is a real important conversation for you and your loved ones to have with your providers to sort of tease apart what does set you off, you know? And a lot of it is having a conversation, um, understanding what the patient's lifestyle is like. Um, first, looking at what the seizure types are. A, a seizure diaries are super helpful. There's a My Seizure Diary, there's seizuretracker.com. These are all really good programs. You now can put them on your phone apps. Um, and it really helps us providers really get a sense of is there a pattern? Um, it, you know, and, and then also allow the families to go back and think, well, what did happen November 1st? You know, was I sleep deprived? You know, did I have a nice little uh, episode of drinking heavily with my friends? Did I skip meds? Was it really stressful? Was there a menstrual cycle going on? Was there an illness? So these apps are really, really useful in helping out um, look at these kind of seizure triggers and understand clusters. And even for people who don't, who can't use the apps, um, no matter any kind of a seizure diary is really, really helpful to us as providers. So um, anyone who can sort of note down the date, the time, anything that might've happened either on an app or on a seizure diary, it's really, really useful for us. So the importance of managing seizure clusters. The problem with repetitive seizures is they may not stop by themselves, just as status doesn't, may not stop by itself. Clusters can turn into status epilepticus. So these, these short self-limiting seizures may then evolve into one big seizure that just doesn't last. Um, if we treat the seizure clusters earlier um, and more effectively, then we can prevent injury to the neurons. We think that what happens is that the neurons become hyperexcitable and that once they seize, it's easier for them to seize again and again and again. Um, we also, you know, when I started doing this, diastat was still fairly new. And what we've tried to do over the years is really to be able to manage any kind of seizure and most particularly clusters quickly and easily without um, sending people to the emergency room. So anyone who has known seizures should have a rescue plan. And that particularly applies to people who have seizure clusters. Clusters can be really, really disruptive. You can imagine if you have one seizure and you recover pretty quickly, that's a completely different thing than if you have three or four in a row and then you're tired and you're sleepy and you just can't go back to work or go back to whatever you were doing. And the untreated clusters add to the healthcare burden. So 
it's not just the cost of medication or the cost of treatment. It's also the cost and, and the cost of the emergency room, the cost of unnecessary neuroimaging, CAT scans and MRIs. Um, it's also the time lost to work. It's the time lost for the family members who have to call in sick, the people who lose their jobs because they're in the emergency room so often with a family member. And it's also, it's a, a huge healthcare cost if um, people are living in residential facilities and the staff has to take them to the emergency room. So then it's overtime, it's the cost of the ambulance, it's the cost of not having somebody available to another patient who needs them. It's the cost to children, the cost to babysitters, um, you know, you can go on and on, but it's really a very difficult thing. So under treatment of seizure clusters, what we found is that a lot of people don't have a cluster seizure action plan. Um, they have a status plan, um, you know, so if they have a prolonged seizure, but as Patty said, we weren't using the language to discuss what's a seizure cluster, when to use this medication. We've only really focused on, well, if your seizure is greater than three minutes, then go ahead and give the diastat. Um, so this was a really sort of opening conversation to people uh, as we started looking at new ways to treat seizure clusters. Um, and what we found was that in some of the studies um, that 20% of patients reported that they would take their seizure rescue medications in response to clusters. So only 20% of patients and that 52% of the clinicians reported that the majority of their patients had a seizure action plan, but only 30% of the patients actually thought that they actually had a seizure action plan. So there's a disconnect here. So people aren't using rescue medications. They feel they don't have a plan. They feel they don't know what to do at that moment. Um, and so there's a disconnect between what we think we're saying, um, what we should be saying, and what's actually being done. Um, some other studies show that we providers aren't prescribing enough of these rescue medications um, in, in, in general. So there might not even be a rescue plan, but there's certainly not enough medication out there uh, being given to the families you know, and we're trying to really enforce with all the providers in our group that no one goes home without a rescue medication. No one goes home without a rescue plan. It should be 100%. No asthmatic should be without an asthma pump. No patient with epilepsy should be without a rescue medication. Patty? All right, so now let's look at evidence supporting treatment for, for seizure clustered. So this is a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial of a diazepam auto-injector. It was administered by caregivers to patients with epilepsy who had acute repetitive seizures. So if you look at uh, the people who use the diazepam, so diazepam is a benzodiazepam, like a Valium that you give to people um, when they have a seizure. So a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial means that the patients don't know whether they're getting the treatment medication or whether they're getting a placebo which contains no medication. So the top line, the yellow, is um, the probability of no seizures and not needing rescue medicines after the time that they were given the diazepam um, versus the people who had the placebo. So you can see that they have better control and less, less um, chance of another seizure if they were given the rescue medicine. So it prevents other seizures. So treatments for seizure clusters, we have a goal. And the goal is that a patient or a caregiver can get the medication in any kind of setting, school, home, work, to avoid a hospitalization, an ER visit. We need to find the lowest effective dose with the least amount of side effects. But the good news is we have a lot of options. Um, we have the diazepam rectal gel, um, uh, which is important. Some patients uh, will just take an extra dose of their already current anti-epileptic medication. Um, there's intranasal administration medications. There are oral benzodiazepines, things that sort of melt on your tongue, or you could take a um, uh, swallow an extra Valium-like pill. There's some different kind of compounded medications. And then there's a, a diazepam buccal film that hasn't come out yet, that's just about to come out, that's also a possibility. So there's a lot of new possibilities besides you know, having something given rectally. Next slide. All right, so when they look at um, the factors that 
led to designing treatment for the seizure clusters, you look at the rate, and so how quickly it's administered, how quickly it gets into your bloodstream and, and up to your brain to stop the seizure, which goes along with rapid bioavailability. You want something that gets absorbed quickly and, um, and works, and it has to be at a level high enough that it's gonna stop a seizure. You have to, we look also at the root of administration. So you think about worst case scenario, I always think about people on airplanes so if they're having seizures on, on an airplane, you wanna have something that's discreet that you can use quickly, get it absorbed quickly. Um, it's easy to carry with you. You know, as a mother, I always think of carrying like bottles of Tylenol and Motrin on planes and they're in Ziploc bags and they're dripping. So you want something that's easy to carry, easy to administer and works really quickly. Uh, so that goes along with portability and ease of administration. You wanna make sure that it's not gonna expire really quickly. You don't have to keep it in the refrigerator. You don't have to carry it in ice. And you wanna have it available in both adult and pediatric dosing formulations because you don't want something that can only be used in adults because lots and lots of kids have seizures and you want it to be safe so that it's not gonna depress your respirations or cause any problems. So what is a seizure action plan? And really everybody, whether you go to school, go to work, should have one. There's a really easy downloadable uh, page that you can download that is nice, pretty purple colors, which is the color for epilepsy month, which by the way, it's epilepsy month. Um, and uh, you basically you and your provider sit and fill it out about how you decide when to give the medication. Um, do you do it when they're after uh, the first seizure? Cause you know that you're the kind of person, if you have one, you're having five that day, or should you wait to the second seizure? Because not at, always after the first one, you're going to have another one. Um, and also if it's a long seizure. And so this seizure action plan is a great time to have a conversation and to have your loved ones there or your family members there. So everybody really knows what's going on. Um, and to give it to the people that really need to know and make sure that the medication is accessible to the people who need to know it. This is really useful at, with school um, and, and like I said, at work and when you travel and family members, you really just don't wanna create that panic of what to do next and then call an ambulance and get exposed to COVID or you know, God knows what else next. Um, and uh, there are other things that are also really useful is um, having my medication schedule available, uh, tips for observa uh, observation of recording of a seizure, instructions of using the seizure calendar, my seizure event diaries, all these things are available online. Um, in addition, and then questions from your healthcare team, just things that you can ask us when you go to the visits. You know, a lot of people come in and they forget what they want to say. So we always tell our families, take notes, take notes. Right, Patty? Right. So this is all on the Epilepsy Foundation website, um, which is what we're speaking for tonight. So if you go to that website, you can find all of these great fillable forms. Um, you know, the seizure action plan you can just type into. And then these are great things for keeping a calendar, keeping a list of events. Um, and then as Steve said, the questions for the healthcare team, because everybody comes in and then they forget what they wanted to say, and then they have to call back later. And it's great if you have all the questions in front of you, so you're not fumbling and forgetting things. All right, so individualizing therapy. So everyone should have an action plan in place. So what happened during, um, COVID in particular, a lot of bad things happened in COVID, but one of the good things that happened is it made all of us as providers much more intent on making sure that people had a seizure action plan and that they had rescue medicine, as Steve said earlier. So it's good to, to develop the plan, become familiar with it, and ensure that you have all the necessary medications. So, and that's on us. I mean, that's on us to make sure that we talk with everyone about the rescue medicines, um, have an action plan that works for both seizure clusters and prolonged seizures and know where that action plan is to be found and making sure that it actually gets to work to the, the um, residential facility, to the group home, to the day program and to school if you're a child or to daycare. Then you have to look at which formulation is the best and the easiest for specific patients. So you have to think about, is it a child? Is it an infant? Um, is it an adult? Is it somebody who's in a wheelchair? So it'd be uh, difficult to administer certain forms of medications. Can they eat? Can they take oral medication? And then we need to train and counsel the caregivers in how to use these rescue agents. So when we start thinking about it, there are, as Steve said in a previous slide, there are different formulations. So there's rectal, there's intranasal, 
Um, and there's IM, which is intramuscular shot, or IV um, intravenous formulations. Those are used more in the hospital or by EMS, like EMS will often do it, um, an IM injection. These all um, make you have to use a needle to administer it, and then you have to think about where you're going to dispose of the needles. The intranasal um, products can cause some tolerance if you're overusing them, erosion of the nasal mucosa and bleeding of the nasal mucosa um, if, you're using, if you're using them a lot. And then rectal application, right, possible trauma to the rectal area, which really is not that big a concern, but the, the bigger problem is person is seizing, it's getting them to turn on their side or get them out of a chair and then pull down their pants and administer the rectal formulation, which can be difficult. It's easy in children and toddlers. All right, so let's go, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so these are the different choices that you have. Um, so on the uh, bottom left is the rectal one. And then the middle one and the right one are the two nasal sprays that are now currently FDA approved. Um, Valtoco all the way to the right is approved for children two and above. Um, Nasalum is for 12 and above. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really excited by these. Uh, we, uh, Patty and I got to participate in the um, Valtoco study uh, before it became FDA approved, as well as in the Questive um, film. Um, and so, you know, it's really exciting to have options for families of things that we can do. And basically, you just have to figure out the dosing for the size. Uh, for the nasal sprays, whether uh, they need one spray or two spray, Valtoco comes in various different dosages um, and nasalum comes in one single dose, but it's either one spray or two spray depending on size and weight. So your provider will decide which one is right for you. Um, and also, you know, which one, you know, have you responded to? You know, Valtoco is a diazepam, so it's a Valium-like drug, um, and nasalum is a midazolam, um, which, you know, some patients have been on midazolam in the past. What, but what's different about these, um, especially for Valtoco, is that uh, these allow the medicine, um, it has a special sauce in there that allows the medicine to get through the nasal membranes faster to get into your bloodstream, to get to your brain. Uh, so if you swallow something, it has to go to your stomach. Um, it's got to get processed by your, uh, your intestines, pass through the liver, then get to your brain. So it takes a little longer. These bypass that whole system um, and get right into the bloodstream very quickly um, and get to your brain. And, and the same with uh, rectal diazepam, but there's a little bit more variability with rectal diazepam getting to where we want it to get to. Um, and so some patients get it respond very quickly to rectal diazepam. Some patients don't, but we've saw a very nice response to the intranasal as well as to the oral uh, administration of the film where it gets into the brain very quickly. Patty, any? Nope, that's a good, good overview. All right, so the current treatment landscape. So the two biggies are rectal gel diazepam or the intranasal either diazepam or midazolam. So, um, the rectal gel, uh, the plasma concentration, so the amount that enters the bloodstream can be affected by pooping the drug out, basically, or it oozing out. Um, there are concerns about rectal administration, especially in public, especially in older people. Um, some schools do not want to administer it. Um, some Sometimes it has to only be administered by the school nurse, so it's hard if kids are going on class trips or they're on a bus. People who are overweight or people who are in wheelchairs, it's difficult to get them out to give them the rectal valium. Some people just don't want to administer the drug because it's rectal. And so the patient has to lie on their side, which can be difficult to maneuvering someone who's stiff and seizing. The intranasal has smaller molecules when they readily cross the blood brain barrier. And it's uh, the drug is transported to the brain by the olfactory nerve or the venous circulation. They're easier, less complex to administer um, I've never seen anyone, and we haven't really ever talked about people being able to self-administer it, although that's something that appears on the seizure action plans, is whether or not um, the patient, usually it's, it's a school seizure action plan, and they'll say, can the student self-administer? But it hasn't been tested in, uh, in that way. Um, the patient or the caregivers have to carry around one or two of the nasal spray devices. By the same token, the rectal gel 
has to be carried around too, and that's in, that's a syringe looking um, apparatus inside a plastic case. Um, so those are the two choices: so rectal gel or intranasal at the moment. But the new one, which Steve will talk about, is exciting. So this is the diazepam buckle film. So it's not FDA approved yet. Uh, we were lucky enough to be one of the centers to do the study on this and got to see it first handed. And we were very excited by this. Um, it's a what's it's called a pharma film. And there's another medication that's actually already out there that uses this technology. And that's a clobazam uh, farm film um, uh, called um, what's it called Pat again? <laughs> The Clobazam, it's Simpazam. Simpazam, Simpazam, yes, <laughs> Simpazam uh, that uses this technology. So you're going to see this technology, that was a brain fart on my part, um, you're going to see this technology used a lot more. And again, this, this film rapidly just sticks to the inside of the cheek um, and then dissolves um, and it doesn't move. Once you pop it in there, it doesn't move, doesn't require water um, and the single dose and it gets absorbed rapidly um, uh, to the patient and you know, exposure is similar to rectal um, and again, less variability in the peaking. So this is very exciting. This is waiting for the FDA um, to bless it um, and soon will hopefully be out into the fam family and pharmacies. You know, this is something different than the gel, different than people who can't tolerate the nasal spray and just something else to offer. Patty? All right. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to end that because I didn't finish the summary yet. So the summary and the important points of this lecture are that seizure clusters are, are unfortunately quite common. And remember, especially in people that have intractable epilepsy and have frequent seizures and those who have a history of going into status or having prolonged seizures. They can have a variable appearance. Um, they can be short and quick. They can be longer, um, but all of them need to be aggressively managed. And we need to tailor the therapy to the individual patients. Best way of doing that is by creating and maintaining a seizure action plan so that we can have optimal seizure management. And we need to counsel families and caregivers on the risks and benefits of each available formulation. Right now we have rectal diazepam and, and intranasal diazepam and midazolam that are approved for use in seizure clusters. However, we have an emerging treatment um, diazepam buckle film that we think will be approved in early 2021. And that's an easy to administer um, buckle film that you just put in your cheek. So, oh. I hope that's really helpful that, you know, A, this has been an exciting year for uh, having an intranasal option. Uh, B, uh, there's going to be a new buckle film option. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's nice to have choices um, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, things to do. What's nice about the buckle film is you can literally put it in your wallet and the, and the little film wafer there. Uh, but the nasal spray is also really small and easy to fit into a purse or a bag as well. So these are a much easier ways. But again, the real main point is we spent a lot of time talking about prolonged seizures and breaking prolonged seizures. But this is talking about clusters, people who have more than one in a 24 hour period, and how it's important for us to break that cycle. Um, and think about how to break that cycle. And if you know that you're going to have or your loved one's going to have more than one in a 24 hour period, it's just better to break it and, and move forward. So you don't have more later on at night and it decreases the worry. Now we have a bunch of questions that came in before this webinar. So we're gonna go through a few of them. You also have the ability to use the chat feature to type in your questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with a couple of these. Uh, Steve, I'm gonna ask you this to respond to this one, which is, is there any known impact of COVID-19 exposure and increased seizure activity? I think this is a really timely question. Um, yeah, great question. You know, we were very concerned that we were going to see a huge uptick in seizures from COVID, but actually it's been relatively stable. We've had a few patients who have never had seizures before who got COVID and had a seizure, but they never had seizures after that, uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, but as far as our patients who have really difficult to control seizures, um, they had, did not necessarily get significantly worse during the illness. Um, I know Dr. Vasquez is on and you know she's the, uh, the guru at NYU. I don't know, Blanca, did you see a large uptick in your patients who got COVID? 
So not not really. Um, I think that like any time that a patient with epilepsy has seizures, I mean, has fevers, the seizures can become more active, but not particularly associated with uh, COVID. I think it's, it's just very important to protect yourself and to prevent infection, any infection, to, to prevent that acute exacerbation of seizures. Right. So then we have a couple of questions that all sort of have a common theme, which is in Blanca, Steve, Stanley, I, Rothman, I see you're there. Um, any of you can shout out to this. They're asking about, um, are there any known patterns in seizure clusters, warning signs? Um, if you've been, you, you've had epilepsy for years and never had a seizure cluster, is there any particular trigger? So these questions are all around, why would you have a cluster? Um, how long is the recovery period after a cluster? And is there any way that you can, uh, I guess, eliminate a cluster happening? Any ideas, anyone? Well, I, I think, again, everybody's very individual about why they go into a cluster. Um, again, from mismedications, drinking too much caffeine, Mountain, Bull, Mountain Dew, Red Bull, um, you know, not getting enough sleep, stress, you know, everybody's really individual and different. And I think it takes time to sort of sort all those things out. Um, I think what's interesting is, and I think what the person's trying, some people are trying to allude to is, say you haven't had your seizure yet, but you feel your aura coming on. And you know, once you get your seizure, you're gonna have more seizures. Should you consider uh, breaking your potential cluster going forward? That's a conversation to have with your provider. Yeah, you might be that kind of person if you have this, some kind of, feeling that's going to happen that if you, if you break it early, you might not get seizures going forward. So um, that's really important. And again, these are these nuanced conversations that you have to have with your provider to tailor it just to you because these kind of treatments are now out there and available to you. And those might be opportunities that you can self-administer or you might notice something in your loved one that might give you an idea that, oh, it's building up and something's going to happen. Um, so here's another question. Um, how long are the recovery periods after cluster? Now, depending, that really is so individualized. Um, depends on what kind of seizures you have, how long they last, and what your typical length of seizure is. So that's kind of an unanswerable question. There's just so many different variables. Um, there's another one. Uh, do other people find that medication can slow or terminate their cluster of seizures? And yes, that's what this Whole talk has been about that we think that there are a lot of alternative, uh, a lot of alternatives of medication that can slow and um, prevent seizure clusters from reoccurring. Um, another one is here: CBD has played an emerging role in some seizure types. Where do you see CBD going for future seizure treatments? Now we know that um, pure CBD is, has, is um, a medication that's used for three, it's FDA approved for three different types of seizures or three different types of epilepsy, um, LGS, Dravase, and tuberous sclerosis. So working in those and we think we'll work in other kinds. And then there's another one, here's another question. Is there a definitive empiric clinical definition for seizure clusters as to the concept of non-random periodicity of seizures? Steve, you wanna take that one? Uh, no, why don't you go ahead and do that one? <laughs> All right. Um, so, and and Blanca, you could weigh in on this too. Um, I the clinical definition is seizures that are so it's two or more within twenty four hours. Beyond that, I cannot really say that there is a definitive empiric clinical definition for seizure clusters. No, I mean that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, Chilton or Logan, do you have anything in the chat that we can, I just looked at it, but I don't, that we can speak to? While you're looking, I just, it's Blanca, I just want to thank you so much for a great overview. And, uh, you know, what a, a good review. And, and more than anything, it's exciting. So exciting to, to see that technology is allowing us now to, to treat clusters in different ways. And I think that the film, like Steve said, it's so, um, easy you can have it in the wallet it's so easy to carry it around so thank you i really appreciate you both are doing this for 
the foundation celebrating Epilepsy Month. There are a couple of um, questions on the chat. One of them is really um, very specific about a child with SCN8A um, who has lots of absence and focal seizures. And I would refer that back to your, your neurology provider to see whether to use the clonazepam or the diazepam. Um, and I can't really answer that question without having any more, without having a lot more information about your child. Um, then we have another question, um, Lamictal. I've read that Lamictal gives birth defects on, on women who take it while pregnant. The usual um, guide that we go by is Lamictal at over 400 milligrams a day. It may cause um, birth defects, but you know any anti-epileptic drug at any dose can, can have um, consequences to the fetus. So the bottom line is, if you think of getting pregnant, yes. sit down and have a conversation with your provider. provider, and you know discuss you know family planning and where the medicine should be, and can some meds be weaned or simplified, and make sure you're not on a high dose. And also to register for the North American um, Epilepsy Pregnancy Registry, so that we have better data to share with um, people throughout the world. There's another question. What are your thoughts on the EPI 743 clinical trial for seizures? And I actually don't know what that is. I don't know either. Blanca, Stanley? <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It stunned us into silence. I'm very sorry. I have to Google it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions that anyone has? Nope. All right, but please go and talk to your provider, see which one of these medication uh, mechanisms are best for you um, and what, what work and, and try them. Um, and I hope this gives you and your family some confidence and some support to really go out there and you know live your life you know with less worry and knowing you have more control and to keep you out of the ER. Um, but it's all about, you know, giving you more self-control and uh, a self of um, a sense of well-being is really important. The other thing is that during COVID, um, we, while you should have a seizure action plan in place and you should have rescue medicine available and you should be using a seizure tracker of some sort, it's really important to never feel like it's unsafe to go to a hospital. So during COVID, we don't want people to be seizing at home because they're afraid to go into the hospital. It's really important. If you ever feel like it, like you want to be somewhere where there are nurses and doctors to take care of you, then by all means go. Everyone is using personal protective equipment. Um, we don't want anyone to be at risk. All right. And thank you all for listening and, and um, logging in. Thank you, Chilton, for inviting us. Thank you, Blanca, for all your work with the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, and we wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. And a quest of thank you for your financial That's support. Quest of, of course, yes. And be safe. Everybody get your flu shots. <laughs> and eat lots of turkey. Mm. Unless you're a vegetarian like Patty. That's like me. <laughs> <laughs> then eat lots of vegetables. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone.